Hi everybody and welcome to this evening's webinar. Um, with Valentine's Day just passed, we thought it was a really nice opportunity to discuss the topic of relationships. I would like to thank my colleague Mary Leonard in the Midlands who has organised this webinar. Um, thank you so much Mary, you've done a fantastic job and hopefully it will be of great benefit to everybody who is listening. Um, so the COVID-19 pandemic has thrown challenges at everybody and I suppose in relation to in relation to relationships, um, it has presented different challenges for different people. So some people are living together at the moment, some people are separated at the moment, they're living separately, um, and the different relationships have different challenges at the minute. And hopefully the tools that um, our speaker this evening is going to give us will help us to navigate those relationships in some way, shape or form <laughs> over the coming months. And so we're absolutely thrilled to be joined by Orla McManus this evening. Orla is a chartered psychologist and she is a mindfulness teacher and she has over 20 years experience in senior roles in both public and private sector. She's going to talk to us again about relationships and I think she's hoping to make it a very interactive session. So she might ask you to send in um, some comments through the chat box as the, as the um, session progresses. If you do have any questions, you can send them in through the chat function or through the Q&A and we might hold questions to the end. We'll try and get through as many as we can. Um, we're going to finish up, we're hoping to kind of run quite on time. So with that, I am going to hand you over to Orla. Thank you so much, Aoife. I'm just going to share my screen just so we can see the slides. So sharing and just from the beginning, just clicking that in. Okay, great. So good evening, everyone. It's lovely that you're able to come on board. And as Aoife said, it shows how important this is to us at this stage. As Aoife said, I'm a psychologist. I have I actually, I think, probably nearly 30 years experience at this stage, but thank you, Aoife, for reducing my age. Uh, I worked in the public sector, I've worked in the private sector, I've worked with people with disabilities, I've worked with staff and organisations, so I have a pretty wide experience. And I do know that one of the things that really supports people is when their relationships are good. So I'm going to just talk to you a little bit about what I hope we'll achieve this evening. And I also then hope that you're starting to think about why you're here, why you tuned in, why you're not watching the six o'clock news. So the first, my hopes really are that you enjoy this session. I hope you enjoy it because it's important. If you enjoy something, well, then maybe you'll, you'll take some of the tips we have on board. I hope you'll reflect really important to just reflect and take that opportunity to say you know how is my relationship I think we don't stop enough and think what is going on you know we're so busy in our lives and I think as Eva mentioned the intensity of lockdown has meant that we really don't have a lot of space I know that I very much feel that at the moment it's very hard to even get some head space never mind physical space I hope you'll implement some of the ideas that we discuss uh, tonight. There are some good sound scientific. I am a psychologist. I like the science. I like the evidence-based information. And that's what I've tried to include as much as possible. What does the research say about what works for relationships of all kinds? I hope you will engage with us a little bit. As Aoife said, I like a bit of engagement normally and face to face, and this is different for all of us, but I do like, I would love if you'd use the chat function at various stages. I'll be asking you to tune in and to get, throw in your tuppence worth, and please, please do. I'll be giving you some tips for self-care, and we'll be doing a little bit of practice, and that'll help us through the session as well, so that I'm just not doing all the talking, but also that you're learning some tips as we go through. And I hope you connect with your own hopes. So just thinking about again, why are you here? Why have you connected into this session this evening? What do you hope to get out of it? So just thinking about what you hope to get out of it might help you when you hear something to actually really connect with it. And remember when we come to the implementation stage that you know this is a goal I need to set or this is something I need to work on. So there are my hopes. I hope they're in line with your hopes. I don't have too many concerns. I think we'll do fine because we're, I'm sticking to a pretty tight agenda. But what I would like you to consider at this stage is to consider one word that comes to your mind when you hear the word relationship. 
So I'm going to ask you if you can, and it'll help me to see if I can see the chat function. Otherwise, I'll be asking Aoife for a little bit of help. One word that comes to mind when you hear the word relationship. Any words that comes to mind? What word comes to mind? And I see the chat function up here. Um, chat. Okay, let's see. Uh, companionship, understanding, support, or lovely, connectedness, love, partner. They're lovely, partner, love, unity, empathy, friendship, communication, friendship. Again, we have friendship coming forward, which is lovely. Empathy again, team coming forward. Warmth, that's a nice one. Warmth, because we've relationships of all kinds and togetherness. Okay, that's lovely. Thank you so much. I'll come back to the chat function. So we have a number of ideas around what a relationship is and all those words actually were very positive and that's, that's lovely because we really want relationships and we want to be in relationships because it makes us feel better. And I think it absolutely enhances our quality of life when we have relationships that are good. So I'm going to just, um, sorry, this is not, get it to move. I just want to talk to you a little bit about a study that was really good and really important that was started actually in 1938. Now there are very few studies in psychology that actually started in 1938. And this one is still going. And it's called the Harvard Study of Adult Development. And basically 724 people took part in the study and they were tested every two years. And when I mean tested, I mean tested. Initially, they were asked questions about their health, about their lifestyle, about their relationships, about the friends that they have, about how happy they were, how they were feeling about how happy they were. And they had two groups really who they were studying. One was Harvard graduates, and one were deprived Bostonians. So people from Boston who were really, really deprived. And then later on, much later on, actually, in about the 60s and 70s, they started to invite the wives to join in. So some of the numbers now, the wives are there too. Initially, the wives weren't involved. And there are 60 of these people that are still alive today, believe it or not. So they've been tested in every way. And really what the findings of the study are, and really, really strongly, are that if you want to be happy, and you want to be happy in older age, the most important thing is to have good relationships. So close relationships come up there as a really high, high in importance. That it's the quality of the relationships you have, not the quantity, and that's reassuring. I think when we're younger, quantity is important. Maybe when we're in our late teens, early 20s, we like to have numbers because we haven't quite decided who we want to have in our camp or in our team, as the word was used. But as we get older, it's the quality. It's the quality. Can we rely on the person? Do we feel that warmth? Do we feel that sense of team? Do we feel that sense of support? And stable, supportive marriages. This was so important. Stable, supportive relationships. Stable, supportive partnerships. This was found to be one of the most important things. So uh, basically, it even said that people, when they were 80, even if they were having a bad day, even if they were having pain, and having a day where maybe they felt you know a lot of pain going on they reported the pain as less painful if they regarded themselves as being in a supportive stable marriage so that's really really important and really really nice to know that a relationship can really take the edge off life's difficulties even when we are feeling uh, vulnerable so stable supportive marriages and um, I suppose something else that has come forward since then is a, a big study that was done recently of people in their 20s and 30s, and they were asked, what do they want out of life? What do they think would make them happy? And 80% of the people said money, money, being rich. And only 20% said that actually they wanted to be famous. So, I mean, shocking. What they need to do is look at this relationship and see look at this study on relationships and see that if you want to be happy what you really need to be doing is to lean into your relationships to your marriages to your partnerships and that if things aren't going as you know we'd hoped and i'm not saying like a lot of the people in this study their marriages were not perfect it didn't mean that people didn't fight people fight they fought all day sometimes but the relationships 
were fundamentally solid and that that's what so really what they say as well is that the relationship you have at 50 can determine how happy you are at 80 so so really leaning into relationships and partnerships is, is of huge value if you want to stay happy and be happy so I really had to look at the research and say, well, who's been studying marriages and who's been studying relationships and same sex partnerships? And it's this couple here, uh, aren't they lovely? This is uh, Julia and John Gottman. And Julia and John have been studying relationships of all kinds for 40 years now. And they have come up with some really good information and some really good data on what makes marriages work what makes relationship work what's important and uh, just to say they're married themselves in case i haven't said that and they're very much still together even during lockdown so what do they say well one of the first things they talk about is that uh, they talk about the sound relationship house so this is about not you know happy campers this is just about a sound relationship and they discuss what makes a sound relationship. And they say there are a number of things that make a sound relationship. One of the first things is the trust and commitment are there, that the house, there are two walls of the house that you can see there. That's really important. The other issues that they talk about that we build in our house as we go through the levels are, the first level there is build love maps. I think, what does that mean? Well, actually, what that means is that you really know each other's world. And I have to say this is a challenge because I'm uh, I've been married for 25 years this year and I absolutely challenge me to think, do I still know who my partner's best friend is? Do I still know what his ideal night out is? Do I still know uh, what he would like to do on a day off? He had a day off. So it, it challenged me to think about that. And I suppose when you think about and start asking those questions, it shows that you have an interest in the other person and it shows that you're still curious. And we know that even from a neuroscience point of view, curiosity is a very positive emotion. So building those love maps. So I'd actually suggest uh, if you really want to have a bit of fun with this and fun is really important in a relationship too, is to do a little bit of Mr. and Mrs. I don't know if any of you remember Mr. and Mrs. from the good old days and ask each other these questions or test each other on, do you know these uh, things about me? Sharing fond fondness and admiration. And we'll have a look about that in more detail because that's very, very important. Turning towards instead of away. I like that because it's two elements there. It's turning towards as in, you know, physical turning towards, but it's also a mental turning towards. It's, it's really being open to communication. It's about a positive perspective, having a positive perspective. It's about managing conflict. And one of the things that is reassuring and was reassuring to me is that conflict is, is not a problem in a marriage. We all have conflicts in our marriage. It's how we manage and communicate with those conflicts. That's the important thing, how we manage. You certainly won't resolve every difficulty that you have, but you, if you learn to manage them, that's really good. And then the Americans making life dreams come true and creating shared meaning. But still, there's a lot in that because we need to have shared dreams. And it's very important to have something to look forward to. And I'm going to be challenging you to think about that as we move forward. You know, what do you have to look forward to? So there were basically what they called here were the four horsemen when marriages or relationships got into trouble or into difficulty of any kind. They said there are four things we need to be careful about. And the horsemen really, that comes from the Bible. They aren't religious at all, but it just means in the Bible, the four horsemen spell the beginning of doom. Now that can sound negative, but that's why they took the name. And they said these four elements in a marriage or in a partnership or in a relationship, they're not good news. And these are the four things we need to be working on. So the four areas here are criticism, so being very critical. Content was the second one, and that's about attacking somebody and attacking the sense of self, insulting somebody a lot. 
defensiveness is another issue that can spell a sense of difficulty in a relationship for people who are very defensive and stonewalling which is really supposed stopping communication but luckily what they did with each one of these particular behavioral difficulties is they gave us the antidote and the antidote is like if you have uh, you get you're poisoned by a snake and you're given the antidote it cures you so i'm going to talk to you a little bit about each of these issues and about the antidote and let's see uh, how we go through so criticism well really that's about verbally attacking somebody and verbally attacking their personality or their character so um this may be something like um, you're so lazy you do absolutely nothing in this house i have to do everything or it might be um, you're absolutely useless at managing the finances why do I have to do everything? Or it might be, um, you never, ever support me when it comes to the children. I'm left to deal with all of their issues. So as you're listening there, and I know they're kind of stress triggering kind of comments, I've just made those critical comments. You may have noticed that a lot of them started with you. You, you. So they were very much an attack. And a uh, the advice is that we move away and avoid you language and actually come back to what we call I language and to own and take responsibility for the issues rather than attacking somebody else. So an example might be, what do I feel? Okay, so what do I feel? So you might say, I feel really tired and I really would need you to help me to empty the dishwasher more often. So that's a gentle start up. You're saying how you feel, you're saying what you need, but it's very clear you're not attacking the person because you're speaking from your own place in what we would call in psychology sometimes as actually adult language. Or you might say to somebody, what do I am? I feel really upset when you talk to my carer like I'm not here. I really need you to include me in the conversation. So again, you're saying how you feel, owning how you feel, and you'll feel much better for it. I think sometimes in Ireland, we're a bit slow to want to own our feelings, but this kind of clarity can really support us in our relationships. So what do I feel and what do I need? Really good to just start on those. And I've just included here that sometimes when we're being criticized or when we're criticizing, rather than just getting into that kind of mode where we're just reacting to a situation so we come into a room or, or we notice that something isn't done that we hope was done but actually rather than reacting if we could actually just take a breath literally just take a breath in this case i'm going to recommend you taking five that you might find that you actually respond much better to the situation rather than reacting and lashing out which rarely ends in good news so let's just do it for a moment. We just take five mindful breaths. So just sitting or lying or standing, whatever position you happen to be in in this moment, and just becoming aware of your breath. And just breathing in and knowing you're breathing in, breathing out and knowing you're breathing out. So just connecting with your breath. So breathing in and breathing out. So breathing at your own pace. Breathing in and breathing out. I'll let you do the others yourself. So just sometimes, how about trying to actually take a breath instead of lashing out? The second cardinal sin as they may call it uh, is called contempt and actually contempt this is really important because they said when contempt happens in a marriage when they see a lot of this in the marriages they believe there's a 90 percent chance and i said 90 percent chance that that relationship or marriage or partnership will not last so contempt what is contempt well it's really about attacking somebody's se sense of who they are and it's about insulting and maybe being very abusive towards a person. So it's not pleasant, it's not pleasant to do it, to actually 
be contemptuous, that's not pleasant to actually be on the receiving end. So how can we work on this? Clearly it's critical if it spells doom. First of all, just to bring you to a little bit of awareness, at the beginning of any relationship, our nonverbal behavior is actually much more positive. We notice this. So we try and we smile more. We try and look at the person. We turn towards them. We do whatever it is. We might flutter the eyelashes or whatever. Um, and, and that's really important. But it's been found that as relationships go on, we actually pay less attention to it. But we really should be paying more attention to it. So one of the things that Julia and John recommend very strongly to repair the marriage is to remind yourself of your parents, of your partner's positive qualities and find gratitude for small positive actions. So this is really, really nice. What we're trying to do here is to remind ourselves of why maybe we were with somebody in the first place and to remind ourselves that of the things that they do that are right. Now, one of the things that we need to be aware of and it's in, as a human condition is that we're much more likely to notice what's going wrong. So we go into a room, perhaps it's the kitchen, and we notice that the dishwasher has not been emptied, but we fail to notice that actually the table is clear and that the children are fed. So we have a negative bias. So we have to actually make a very strong attempt and effort to remind ourselves of what is going right in our relationship. And we need to do things like noting the small things often, doing small things often, like making that cup of tea, um, like you know, noticing that somebody's wearing a nice top, um, like listening to somebody and smiling and saying hello, greeting. These are the things that slip and slide when we allow contempt to take over. So I actually have a question for you now. I'm going to ask you to just, if you wouldn't mind, to try and go to the chat box and I'll see if I can get the chat up here. Um, to try and see what are you grateful for in your relationship? What are you grateful for now? What, what, what actually? Kindness, you're grateful for kindness. Kindness is so important. Any kindness, his kindness, kindness again. This is what makes often relationship last. Temperament, so I assume here you're grateful for somebody's temperament. Hugs and closeness, the physical contact. Mental balance, love and health, support. A life shared, and like that's wonderful. You're grateful here, somebody said, for somebody who calms me down. Well, that's absolutely so nice that if you have a partner who can calm you down. And I hope you tell him laughter, laughter, the presence of fun. We'll be having a look at that. Support, grateful for his ability to make me laugh and support me on bad days. Companionship, you're grateful for understanding. Wonderful. Small things like the mighty around the hot water bottle. Oh yes, he sounds gorgeous. Hold on to him or her. And um, that's so nice. Okay, well that's just giving us a sense, a sense of humor. I still make him laugh. Lovely. These are the things we need to remind ourselves of. These are the things we need to work on very much when it, to actually keep that culture, and we call it a culture, it's a way of doing things uh, alive, to keep a positive culture alive in our lives, in our families, in our homes, in our relationships. And I just have a few more ideas for you there. And you'd have no problem with any of this based on the information you've given me there in the chat is, the 10 finger gratitude exercise is a really nice one to work on. Really, this is maybe your mood is dropping. Maybe you've, you're in a bad mood with your partner. Uh, maybe you're angry or maybe you're just feeling a bit low. 10 finger gratitude at, at exercise is lovely to just sit. You can do it every, anywhere and just actually go through. You don't have to touch your fingers, but it helps if you can sometimes actually say, what are the 10 things I'm grateful for in my relationship? I'm grateful for the fact that he makes me tea on a Saturday morning. I'm grateful for the fact that um, he makes dinner on a Saturday evening. So the food theme going on here. So whatever it happens to be for yourself, really good. Or you could do it for anything, but in this instance, for the relationship, it can be really good. Another evidence-based approach to staying positive is to have a gratitude journal. I'm sure some of you have had this. It's so easy to be swamped by negativity. 
it's so easy to have, have that negative bias taking over the negative bias that really makes us look on the dark side all the time we need to work very hard at keeping the positive side up so a gratitude journal could be perhaps that you write three things every night in your gratitude journal in fact from positive psychology they say that we do this for 21 days it's as good as a boost as you'd get from prozac believe it or not you could do it with your partner three things we're grateful for let's do a gratitude i know somebody who did it with their family at the dinner table every evening it can be important as well to just decide with your partner that you're going to tell them what you appreciate about them you know initially we were always we were great at these things when we married first you know what we loved about them we appreciate it and sometimes we forget and it's so nice to hear what somebody appreciates in you so actually just tell somebody would be really good and to watch that negative bias you have to work harder it says you have to actually five times more positivity to one time negativity to keep the bounce going to keep the boost going and i know how hard that is at the moment so really really doing all you can to boost things um, by making an effort to be extra positive and you'll feel better for it as well so the third one there, the third um, horseman, as it's called, defensiveness. This is one I think you know, you're all familiar with. I know I am. And that's really about victimizing ourselves, playing the victim so that we don't, we're not attacked. You know, it's kind of leave poor little me alone. Uh, I've been, I'm exhausted. Or I've been so busy all day. And that, that may be true, but sometimes if we use that all the time, it actually isn't really taking responsibility and it isn't really accepting your partner's perspective and one of the things a word that come up a lot earlier on was the word empathy which is very nice and empathy and empathizing putting yourself in your partner's shoes just for a few minutes just even i think it was a biden said you know just stand in their shoes just for a moment so this is about accepting your partner's perspective and offering an apology for any wrongdoing it can be very hard to say sorry it can be very hard to apologize but it's very powerful when we do so what might the language what might you use what might we say you might say something like i was supposed to yes you're right i was supposed to ring the garage to sort the car out that is my fault you're taking responsibility let me try and get to it tomorrow so we've apologized, we've acknowledged, or um, yes, the place is a mess. That is my fault. I just couldn't keep on top of it today. Uh, let me try to tidy it up now or to tidy it up tomorrow. So really, I suppose the defensiveness issue is just about taking responsibility, owning it. And it can, it's amazing how it can shift a conflict quite quickly rather than getting into um, uh, row or a lot of tension very quickly so just another little exercise that you might use when you're feeling defensive you're feeling low you're feeling like the world is about to you know is attacking you well here's a very very simple one and this is basically about just taking a moment and noticing perhaps five things you can see wherever you are can you notice five things you can see so the window the lamp the light, the chair, the floor. So you'll notice that when you're doing this, you're not thinking about other stuff. And sometimes our thoughts, you see, can keep a lot of conflict going and aggression going. So just, just really trying to get, bring it back to breath and balance. So four things you can hear. Can you notice four things you can hear wherever you are? I can hear my clock, I can hear the hum, I can hear a silence, I can hear a car. And three things you feel. So this could be emotional, like I feel tired, I feel good, or it could be I feel the wind on my face, I feel my hands colder, I can feel pins and needles in my toes, whatever it is. Just using these strategies of self-care to manage your relationships as well and to manage your relationships better. And it'd be really good if you could do this with your partner. 
and then stonewalling. Stonewalling is, is the last a uh, major horseman. And what's that? Well, what they noticed was, Julia and John noticed that when they had couples in therapy, that often a row would start. And you know, we all have our typical rows. So it might be about the childcare, it might be about finance, or it might be about your mother or my mother or whatever it might be. We all have our issues. What they noticed was that when people started to, to really fight and it, when it became very intense, that if they asked them to take a break, that it had a very powerful effect on how the argument was, was actually managed. So they'd say to somebody, oh, look, we need you to take a break now. And the couple would separate. So they really encouraged them, go, go your separate ways. And what they noticed was that people started to self-soothe. So self-soothing might be something like they pick up a magazine and start to read it. Or they might distract themselves, like with some of the exercises I've just done. They'll do some breathing or um, they start to notice what's going on around them, just to take their mind off the intensity of the row. Because what happens in the row sometimes when we get to this very challenging state is that we are completely overwhelmed, completely overwhelmed physiologically. And that this that it's impossible to move forward with psychologically with your with your argument or saying what you need to say. So they found that if you took a break for 15 to 20 minutes and then asked the couples to come back, they were much better able to manage and resolve whatever issue it was. So their advice is very much if you get to a stage in a row where you're really getting nowhere and maybe one of you is about to march off and hide or is about to just shut down in whatever way I'm not talking for the rest of the night I'm not talking for the week or in some cases not talking for three weeks to actually say no you know just give me give me 15 minutes or can we talk about this in an hour and take yourself off and actually do some self-soothing and that self-soothing could be a cup of tea it could be looking at the magazine anything you can do to prevent yourself to, to actually reduce that sense of being flooded with anger or overwhelm and then see how it works when you come back. Uh, some couples actually, what they do is they have a signal. They might say, oh, we need a break or um, whatever the signal is, or it might be a wink or it might be, a, oh, we need to stop now. I need, I need to just, uh, I need to take a break. Whatever it is that works for you, as long as it's agreed with your partner, that'll be good enough. So stonewalling is really what we're talking about there again it's a whole sense of being flooded and overwhelmed and something uh, a very useful tool for mindfulness is what we call the three minute breathing space and i'm going to just uh, get you to do that now you may not do three minutes but um i'm just going to practice it with you it's lots of these uh, exercises on the three minute breathing space in particular is on the internet in lots of different places so what's here just asking you to sit up or to sit in a way that's comfortable for you or lie in a way that's comfortable for you whatever is your preferred position so step one in the breathing space is awareness so just asking yourself what is my experience right now what are my thoughts what do i feel am i aware of any bodily sensations so just tuning in and then gathering your attention. So redirecting your attention at this stage, your full attention to your breathing. So connecting with your breath. So if you want to calm down, get breath and balance, connect with your breath. Your breath has been there from the very beginning. So breathing in and knowing you're breathing in. Breathing out and knowing you're breathing out. So breathing in and breathing out. You may even say something to yourself as you're doing this and as you're breathing, you may say to yourself, calm, calm. And then expanding the awareness around your breathing to include your body as a whole your posture and your facial expression. So expanding the awareness, your whole body, 
sitting, standing, lying here, breathing. So perhaps attempting something like that when you take your breathing space or your self-soothing space when you, if you are in overwhelm in the middle of a row and you're trying to deal with it more productively. Another little technique that can be helpful is what we call RAIN, it's an acronym for dealing with difficult emotions. And RAIN is to just, to know, to recognize what's going on. Oh my goodness, I'm becoming overwhelmed with anger here, or I'm becoming overwhelmed with annoyance, or overwhelmed with the sense of, you know, feeling incompetent, whatever it is. The A is to allow the experience to be just as it is. So literally you'd say, you know, allow it, I'm overwhelmed. That's it, that's my experience right now. The I is to investigate with care. So you may say, where can I feel this emotion in my body? Where is it? Is it maybe you're feeling it in your heart or in your tummy or your face? And then to nurture yourself with self-compassion, really important have a sense of self-compassion they really in relationships you need to put your own mask on first like in the aeroplane back in the good old days when we could travel so nurturing with self-compassion so really i really need to mind myself here i really need to give myself a little break from this row i really need to look after myself in this moment so the next time you're feeling maybe a little bit overwhelmed you might try one of those including you know rain remember rain a psychologist who's done an awful lot of work in the area of burnout, and I think a lot of us know what burnout is, leads to sleep problems, aches and pains, lack of energy, depressed mood, and a sense of complete exhaustion. Mary Asberg noticed that a lot of the people who were coming to her with burnout had the same approach to actually dealing with stress, and to dealing with long-term stress. What she noticed was, what they did was, they dropped the very things that were really good for them and that supported them, the more stressed they became. So for example, um, people might um, have always gone out for, on a Thursday night for a pizza or might have had a phone call daily with their mother or uh, might have you know, had a takeaway on a Friday night, whatever it is. And what they start doing when stress hits is, oh, no, I don't have time for, you know, meeting people on a Thursday night. And no, I don't have time for um, having a takeaway. Um, I'm going to, you know, I need to do something else. Or I don't have time for talking to my mother. Who has time for chatting? Who has time for, I don't have time for meeting my friends. Who has time for meditating? Dropping the very things that support them. And one of the first things she gets people to do is to start to look at their day and say, how much is in your day that actually nurtures you, that actually gives you an up, that actually gives you enough activity? So I'm going to ask you to think about your day now. I mean, in lockdown, it's very challenging. What is nourishing you personally? We'll have a look at the relationship in a moment. What's depleting you? What's bringing you down? How can I ensure that I have enough up activities? How can I ensure that I have up activities that will actually support me and support my well-being? So just thinking about this, let's bring it forward now to your relationship. and Let's have a look at what's happening in lockdown. So I want to ask you to start thinking about lockdown and thinking about your relationship in lockdown. And I think a lot of us have been very challenged in lots of ways. And I suppose the ways uh, that have challenged us are things like our roles have changed. That's a huge one. I know uh, certainly in my experience, that's been the case, that not only are you working, you're also the CEO of the house. You're also doing breakfast, lunch and dinner. Um, or perhaps you're noticing that maybe the caring role has changed and that maybe your carer can't come to the house anymore and somebody else is coming in or can't come in, or your husband is doing caring, or your wife or your partner, this has changed. Along with that, then boundaries change, and um, boundaries change because if physically the boundaries change, the workplace is the home, the, you know, uh, the home is the workplace. All the implications of that are very stressful. Our comfort zone, or what was our comfort zone, is no longer our comfort zone. In fact, we've been, we've been taken over completely. 
In fact, I was talking to somebody during the week who said that she now uh, doesn't have lunch with her partner uh, during the day. In fact, they do sit in the kitchen together, but at opposite ends, facing in the opposite direction. And that sounds very negative, but she said for her, it's actually really, really positive because they were together too much and they were fighting too much. So um, anxiety can be a big issue for us in lockdown relationships, and particularly maybe if one partner is particularly anxious, and we'll have a look at that in more detail. But those of you who are doing homeschooling, my heart bleeds. It's a really tough station. And uh, I suppose your own ideas, just thinking about them. I'm going to just ask you just what are you doing to nourish your relationships during lockdown? So if anybody would like to, I'm going to go to the chat function to just join us for a moment and tell us what are you doing? What are you doing to nourish yourself or your relationships during nice meals? Love it. I think it comes back to basic stuff, like literally like uh, nourishing yourself. For a lot of us, it has been meals and having family meals. Okay, any other ideas? What are we doing to nurture ourselves? Communication is the key. Yes, it really is. Cooking a lot. Watching a good film. That's lovely. Watching a movie. Going for walks. And, and, and having you know, a possible, a mindful walk and, and trying to go on different walks, 5k drives. Oh, you're very good. Wine. Yeah, wine. I think the whole country's in lockdown wine, but wine, I think if we, if we can manage the wine, it can be really supportive. Uh, reaching out to others. That's lovely because helping others. Sunday fun day. Oh, that's lovely. Fabulous idea. So you're playing family games and having family walks. And, and really attempting, and I'm sure that's probably different. Uh, planning the garden for summer, oh, very nice, very nice. And gardening is so good for us, so good, literally. Um, but the soul gardening is good for us in every respect, so lovely. Utilizing technology of not living together. Okay, so that's a huge issue. If you're not living together during lockdown, I know this was mentioned to me earlier on that some people are not living together. Actually, utilizing technology is, is nearly all you can do but another lovely idea that i saw last night on the news some of you may have seen for people who were are not living together it was because of valentine's day they did a little feature on it and um what they found was a sending a letter an actual physical letter was a lovely idea as well so uh, but using zoom using the um whatsapp using any of the platforms, Teams, whatever one it is, is, is nearly all you can do. And maybe if you can drive within the 5K, you know, uh, meeting for a socially distanced walk. And um, there somebody's had a problem with the sound. So apologies about that. It is being recorded. This session is being recorded. So um, you can, Aoife will, will talk about that at the end. It's going to be on the website, I understand. So let's look at the ideas that... Um, I thought of here and I researched in terms of what other people are doing to nourish their relationships during lockdown. A uh, key one was to actually give and take space. That's just come up again and again and again. It's been very important. So, you know, your partner may love you to bits, but they may need space. And most relationships need to actually time apart in order for the time together to be successful and to have the communication. I mean, so much of our relationships, I know in mine, anyway, was how was your day? What happened? Who did you meet? Where did you go? All those kind of conversations and they're gone if you're together all the time. So giving time and space and let them take their walk on their own, let them have them lunch on their own, you know, whatever. People have different requirements. Getting together, you somebody mentioned wine. I, I was decided to be very politically safe and say a cup of tea together in the evening. Maybe just agreeing to have a cup of tea together in the evening. The last lockdown, it was lovely. Um, with the weather was good, you could you could be outside and it was nice. The other thing I know some of you mentioned uh, watching movies and movies are great. Uh, having a favorite program and watching it together. All this just to help our sense of togetherness and being together. Another idea that I thought was lovely is reading to each other and um, or having your partner read to you. I was actually very ill myself in January and my partner was read to me and I just thought, you know, how nice. I couldn't concentrate myself on, on reading. Uh, it was so lovely to 
have somebody read to you and it was quite romantic as well I'd have to say uh, get that sense of togetherness preparing a meal together you know uh, you a lot of you have mentioned food and doing food together and it's food is so nice and we can you know light candles and make an effort but something that I thought uh, was nice was actually preparing the meal together and somebody spoke to me about this and they said the reason I really like that is because you're not on your own doing it and I thought that was pretty profound you know so preparing the meal together uh, meditate together you know it can be something that if, if you're into meditation or you'd like to try it there's lots of short meditations you know work on your mental health and meditate together can be lovely and yeah, your own ideas were lovely I don't know if there are any other ideas I'll look at the chat and just see did anybody ah I found it useful to hand over the tv remote control the only problem is when will I get it back <laughs> Okay, very nice. Very nice. I think we all have those control issues in a relationship and there's nothing wrong with having those kind of ongoing rows. It's how we manage them. We simply won't resolve them all. Um, it's not possible. Okay, so moving on, and if you have any other ideas, please do. I, I looked up just Relate, who are the UK Marriage Guidance uh, Organisation. And they, their advice really for relationships at the moment were trying to work out what is really bothering you. And this could be when you're either living together or you're not living together. Is the relationship the problem or is it lockdown? Uh, because I did actually meet a friend last week who his partner was living in Mayo and she's in Dublin and, and she was really giving out about him. And I was saying, you know, is it really him? You know, is, is it really him? Are you sure it's not just the fact that you, the distance is terrible and that you're trying to manage to keep something going uh, on technology and at times, you know, let's look at what's going on and being specific about needs. So again, we're back to what do you need? I feel I need and being clear about what you need. And sometimes it can be useful to write that down or type it down or put it into your recorder and keep your expectations realistic. And I, I think that is really the most important one. We all enter into relationships with huge expectations but and, and rarely are, are they all met but particularly at the moment we are in the middle of a global pandemic that has had massive implications for all our lives there's only so much we can achieve and there's only so much we can do so just looking at your expectations dealing with the anxious partner i mentioned this anxiety is a huge part of what's going on at the moment for people and a you know there's a low level anxiety going on for everybody i think because humans don't like this level of uncertainty and there's huge uncertainty out there but what happens when you're dealing with a particularly anxious partner this can be very difficult and one of the tips that's very important is actually to show empathy and understanding and say really again we're back to you know standing in the person's shoes and saying i know you're really nervous about getting catching COVID. I know you're really nervous about the future. I know you're really nervous um, if you become ill. But showing empathy and understanding and really genuinely showing that you are doing that. But also maybe for the sake of both of you, agreeing limits on the anxiety in relation to COVID. So it might be something like saying, but can we just discuss the numbers, the daily numbers once during the day, maybe around six o'clock? or uh, at, at lunchtime uh, rather than discussing it continuously throughout the day or can we agree that this is that after seven o'clock in the evening we don't discuss uh, these anxieties that we try and relax that we try and unwind that we try and put them to bed but i promise tomorrow you'll have your opportunity again so any of those ideas and um, that you could try and um, give it a, give it a go and i suppose one of the things with anxiety and anxiety in general is that our thoughts can really get carried away. Our thinking is wonderful, but our thoughts can really be like wild horses. So we'll go from zero to a thousand very, very quickly and think, you know, one minute we've got a mild cough, the next minute we're actually, you know, we're in ICU. And this has all just happened in our head. And unfortunately, our bodies think it's real. So we keep an eye on your thoughts, particularly at this time of great anxiety. And if you notice that they've gone off, that they've gone wild, literally stop. Say stop. You could even say to yourself, stop and take five mindful breaths. So 
taking a breath, even take three, even take one mindful breath. So a mindful breath again is just connecting with your breathing. I'm just noticing my breathing. I'm just breathing in and knowing I'm breathing in. I'm just breathing out and knowing I'm breathing out. Another thing you may do with your thoughts, sometimes it can be very useful to put some distance between your thoughts and yourself. And psychologists call that decentering. So getting it out of your head. So you might write them down, you might type them up, or you might speak into a recorder, whatever works for you. And um, again, you're just trying to bring it back. And this is my lockdown puppy. This is Oscar. I hope you love him. <laughs> I certainly do. Uh, Oscar arrived unexpectedly into my family home in April. And uh, while initially it was something of a shock, uh, I now absolutely love him. But Oscar is, you know, most our thoughts are a bit like a puppy dog. They're wonderful, they're fun, they'll play, they can dream wonderful dreams, but sometimes they bring us back things we really don't want and we really don't want to look at. So our thoughts are the same. So notice when your thoughts have gone, oh, there's the puppy dog. Let's go back to my breathing or even just connect in with how am I, how am I sitting or how am I feeling or my hands or notice my hands or notice my feet or uh, notice how I'm sitting or let's notice what's going on around me. What can I see? What can I hear? What do I feel? Just bringing yourself back to reality. So just a little reflection as we come towards the end. We're not quite there, but we're, we're moving towards the runway. And um, just a reflection, something for you to think a little bit about yourselves and just some questions that you can allow to wash over you. So uh, just asking you to think about how are you communicating with one another at the moment? And I know that can be, that's very challenging. How are you communicating what's working? What perhaps is not working so well? Are you communicating in an adult and assertive way? And I suppose that's about the, being the grown up and the, the owning responsibility, the I, I need, I feel. Do you both have space? This is important. Do you both have space, mental, physical space? And sometimes, you know, it can be a good idea to just text each other even when you're in the same house. Are you having fun? Some of you sound like you're having fun, fun, fun day, but are you having fun? Because that's very, that, that'll really give you energy that nourishes any relationship. We all need fun. And if we've stopped having fun, well, let's sit down and work out how we're going to have fun. And that could even include watching funny uh, comedies. Because comedies, actually looking at comedies, even if we're feeling in an off, awful form, uh, often despite ourselves, they'll boost the mood. And to do that together, that's very nourishing. Do you have experiences to look forward to? And I suppose, you know, at times during all this lockdown, we've all felt there was nothing to look forward to. But to just stay, you know what I mean? This too will pass. And what could we plan? What would be really nice to do when this is over? Because having something to look forward to, we know from, psych from positive psychology in particular is important. How do your arguments end? You know, are you apologizing? Do, are they resolved? Are you managed? You're not, going to, you're not going to agree on everything. Nobody ever is. But is there some kind of resolution? You might at times want to think about the pros and cons of your relationship. Uh, are your needs being met? And are you working on all aspects of the relationship? And sometimes we can really just focus on one aspect. Whereas really, to have a connection with somebody, we need to be thinking about the full person and the full aspect of their lives, including, including intimacy, including any kind of a connection, an emotional connection. And at the moment, with so much stress going on, it can be difficult, that can be quite wearing. So just to reflect on some of those thoughts. And I suppose, you know, with that in mind, I'm going to ask you to consider one area that you may consider working on in the next week for your relationship. So this is the challenge one area i'm going to work on so only one area in the next week and i'll have a look at the chat we'll see if any of it come up so one area you're going to work on he's so cute and that's oscar 
thanks for a very useful refresher for all the therapy I did in the past, equipping myself for a positive future, a possible future relationship. Great. We can remind ourselves what actually makes a relationship work so that we, we're heads up when we come into. You want to listen to him better. Excellent. Um, communication. Communication is key. One area, communication. So this is popular. You're going to work on your communication again. I'm just thinking about how you're going to do that. Have more fun. I love it. You might want to do a fun list. You're going to work on your anxiety. And not even about COVID. I know anxiety can take over. It can take over everything. I'm going to try and empathize more. Well done. That's a really brave step and a difficult, a difficult step. And hopefully practice self-compassion. Praise him more. Great. I love it. See what difference that makes, you know, to the relationship and how it's going. Okay, thank you. That's a lovely selection now, just as we come towards the end. And just to really ask yourself, because often we can leave a session like this with the best will in the world, thinking you're going to work on it. But just to ask yourself honestly, what might get in the way of you actually doing what you say you want to do? What might get in the way of you actually making that step or to improve communication, to have more fun together? And what might you do to overcome the barrier? So thinking about the barrier that you put in your own way and what might you do? If you do that, you, I think you, the chances of you actually then doing it will be greater. So just reminding you uh, about your really a wellness toolkit is make sure you're connecting as much as you can with your with others and um, hopefully you're being as active as is possible for your physical well-being taking notice enjoying the moment using mindfulness this is a great time for mindfulness because there's so little that we can actually do so to actually just be would be wonderful keep learning expanding your knowledge would be good Give and sharing your time and looking at how am I spending my time? You may be with your partner, but are you spending time? Are you spending quality time? Are you taking notice of them? Are you listening? If you're being defensive, you're not listening. You're simply thinking about the wonderful thing you're going to tell them back. Using gratitude and gratitude is so important for that culture in your relationship. Being compassionate with yourself too and managing those thoughts. And just something to actually maybe to have a bit of fun with. Sit down with your partner and design that beautiful day you're going to have or afternoon or out when all this is over. You know, what would be really nice? And if you can do one while it's going, that's great. Let's design a beautiful day together. What would be something that we'd really love and that would be good for us? And plan it and live it. From positive psychology, we know that this is something that will give you a wonderful bounce. So uh, please make it part of your plan. And then I suppose for some of us, no matter what we do and no matter what we try, our relationships are in difficulty, in trouble, and uh, we probably need and benefit from some additional support. So I just wanted to mention to you uh, some places, if you do feel like you want to speak to somebody or you do feel like you need additional support, obviously the MS Society itself is a wonderful society and uh, I only know Mary a, a little while, but I, I know that she's, she's a wonderful listener and I know that you'll get the support you need. And I know there are other people out there uh, who work with you and who will give you, a, you know, point you in the direction of some support. The same with the public health nurse. I know public health nurses are marvellous and um, they are a great resource, including maybe even your GP, I should have said there as well, can really help in terms of uh, providing some support, who will support you with your relationship. Accord is the national uh, marriage uh, guidance organization and they're still working during lockdown and uh, we have women's aid you know if you really feel that you're under a lot of pressure and uh, perhaps you know the relationship has become quite abusive uh, in that situation women's aid are actually operating a 24 7 um line so to know that and the rape crisis center as well now there are other places to go but i think that uh, some of those should really help you and never forget as well about the samaritans samaritans are there 24 7 to help you 
And just finally, just to say, you can't stop the waves, but you can learn how to surf. So this is about, you know, marriage it, and relationships and partnerships that can be bumpy, that can be challenging, that can be difficult. Uh, uh, but it doesn't mean that you can't learn and that you can't change and that you can't learn and that things can't improve because they can. So I'm going to go in the chat line and I'm going to ask Aoife to come in again as well. We have a few questions. Yes, certainly. I will come back to ask the questions. Lovely. Thank you, Orla. Okay, that's lovely. So uh, Aoife, you're back. I'll get rid of the chat line. Friends. Uh, no, you, you just have to stop um, sharing your screen, Orla. Okay, so I'll stop sharing the screen. Lovely. Okay, perfect. So yes, we do have um, some questions in. But first of all, Orla, thank you so much. And um, that was fantastic. And there's so many practical tools there for people to be able to use. And you know, I think some of them, they're so simple, but we often kind of forget to use the tools that we actually have, um, especially at a time like this when there are so many pressures on. And, you know, lots of people are homeschooling, they're juggling work, homeschool, um, and then trying to, you know, navigate successfully in relationships too. So um, it's great. Thank you. And, and, and Eve, on that note, not to underestimate again how difficult it is and how challenging it is. So if you're managing it all, you're fantastic. So we do have a few questions in now. Some of them were emailed in in advance and then some of them, or some of them have come in through the Q&A. Um, so the first one I'm going to go to is um, from an individual who is 34 years old and has been married for 10 years. They have been diagnosed with MS and they're finding it hard with their MS symptoms that are affecting them sexually with their husband. Um, they have a lack of feeling and it's very disheartening and they don't know how to deal with it best. They're feeling like a little bit of a disappointment and like they're letting down their husband's needs. Oh, it's so hard. That's just so difficult. You know, those, those feelings are so difficult. Um, what I would say is really, th th you really need to get in contact with your local MS community support worker and um, they'll point you in the direction with support, but also there are resources. I know I've been told that there are resources on your website. Is that right, Aoife, in relation to this issue? Or, um, or they will be put up um, if they're not there at the moment. So I really would recommend, I mean, that you get some maybe one-to-one -one support on this particular issue because it is big. Uh, but I'm sure your husband is actually very understanding and, um, but I think you need some one-to-one. -one. So talking, I think, to your MS community support worker would be a really good starting point and looking out for the resources, which I believe will be, will be up there. Um, another one in asking if you have any tips for single people in lockdown and um, that they feel that their life is on hold, they're not getting any younger and online dating, to, uh, online dating just hasn't worked for them. They're coping with lockdown quite well but are sick of waiting to meet someone special. Listen, it's so hard. Um, I was reading stuff over the weekend about people who are in the same position. You, you're not alone. I thought that's the first thing. Um, it's really difficult and I've heard some, you know, worrying stories about people and meeting, having meetups and feeling under pressure to do things they didn't want to do purely because of the pressure of lockdown. But I would say is, you know, maybe try, I know online dating didn't work for you, but maybe you try it again because there is nothing else at this moment and uh, to just maybe organize a few chats Meet a few people online if you can. And really, if you can wait, if you can wait until you, you know, things improve in terms of lockdown before meeting somebody. There is no, there is no, I don't have the answer, if I the full answer, but all you all we can do is um sorry, there's my own phone. Okay. All we can do is um all we can do in a situation like this is to be patient with ourselves and to be patient with I'm so sorry now that uh, I thought that was that, that, that was bad. That's um, right. Sorry. Um, so we have another question in from somebody. They say that they are homeschooling and working from home and their partner is working outside of the home and they're exhausted by the time their partner gets home from work, having homeschooled and worked simultaneously all day and their partner does not seem to understand how difficult this has been for them. What's the best way to communicate this without making their partner feel bad or add extra negativity on top of everything that's going on at the moment? 
Well, I think it's really important for that person that they actually do communicate with their partner. Because, you know, uh, we can do a bit of mind reading in a scenario like this, like you're going to make the situation worse. You might make the situation better. I'm sure your partner knows you're absolutely exhausted and that the relationship is impacted by this uh, homeschooling and trying to do everything else. So I think uh, sometimes it's nice to maybe, one way would be to have that cup of tea in the evening together and say, listen, we're going to take in a half an hour now. And maybe just for the person to discuss, you may wonder why I'm feeling, I'm feeling so um, exhausted and I'm feeling a bit low and things aren't great. So I just like to discuss how I'm finding things and what maybe I need from you in relation to this scenario. So I think not communicating won't be the issue, but try to communicate and uh, try to try to um and don't expect put major pressure on one conversation you know we, sometimes we, we need we need quite a few conversations and you may say over the course of maybe a week or over the course of a month look let's see is there anything we can do to um to improve the situation to support support each other at this time without being defensive without attacking without being negative simply owning the issue and, and putting it on the table um, and there's another question in then from people who are both working from home and they said that they're spending lots of time together and whereas normally they would have their own day and plenty to come home and tell each other and talk about and they're feeling that a little bit like you're not bringing anything new because anything that's happened that day the other person already knows. Um, so do you have any advice um, in terms of keeping the quality of conversations between couples from going stagnant at this point? Well, it, it, it is really hard not to, for the relationship not to feel stale at this moment. But what I would say is to take more individual space if you can at every opportunity to actually prioritise that. It might be the opposite when you go back to work. To actually go for a walk on your own actually take time in a room on your own you know to listen to your music or to do read on your own actually take space like i mentioned the couple earlier on who are having lunch in the kitchen but consciously not talking or communicating with each other because they just need the space and they found that that's really helping them to talk at dinner and um, so you just have to get creative around that also not to the expectations a lot of you know a lot of the sort of Frisian that you would be there when we're you know not seeing each other and talking to each other that is that is absent at the moment and maybe just to say it will return it will return but um, it's, it's not easy but just take space take as much as you can uh, look at the boundaries in the house are you taking enough space uh, and a, a final question then Orla it's again from somebody who's been working full time during the pandemic um, and their partner is not working at the moment because of lockdown and their partner tries to talk to them throughout the day. Um, they're getting really frustrated with this and they have tried to, um, or, because they can't concentrate properly, they've tried to tell their partner that they need them to stop because they need to concentrate and they feel like they are cranky because of it. Um, so what is the best way to communicate this frustration and have it heard? <clears throat> clearly. <laughs> the best way is really clearly. Yeah, you know, I, I, sometimes we think we are communicating these things, but we're not. We're, we're hinting. We're, um, we're giving little signals and the person isn't picking it up. And clearly this person hasn't picked this up. So, um, I would really put it on the table. I'd pick a time. You might say, I want to talk to you about something later on. Um, so that you're maybe giving advance warning, you know, in a very positive way. But I really want to talk to you about something. And what you might say, I, I am feeling uh, very stressed during the working day because I can't concentrate. Um, I really enjoy talking to you. But during working time, I need to have space on my own to get the work done. So what can we do about it? So it's really just been very clear. And I would question as well, where is that person working? You know, are you at the kitchen table? You know, maybe that's somebody else's space. Maybe, you know what I mean? Is it too easy? Are you in a traffic zone? Perhaps you need to move position in the house or in the apartment. Um, you really, really do uh, to need to have your own space. And you may need with somebody, you may need to remind them, remember, remember what we said. I need the space and I look forward to talking to you later, but I really need to concentrate now. So sometimes um, with an issue like this, 
we need to get very good at repetition. Say it nicely. I need. I need. What did we say? That's great. Is that okay? That's fantastic. Orla, thanks so much again for joining us this evening. I think this has been fantastic and, and especially answering the questions from people as well. You can see the kind of frustration that there is in the community. Um, and I think a lot of people will be able to relate to each other's issues. Um, as you say, nobody, nobody is experiencing this on their own um, with the current climate. So um, thanks so much for, for joining us. Orla. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, I've loved it. I hope it was helpful. Absolutely. Um, you know, be, be gentle with yourselves. Be gentle with yourselves. This, this too will pass. That's great. Orla, thanks so much. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you so much. Thank you.